In this episode, I'm joined by Dr. K. A. Shakur, spiritual life coach, doctor of traditional Chinese medicine, and author of several books, including Ghetto Sutras and Maha Yoga. Dr. Shakur recalls his childhood upbringing, in which he overcame illness and bullying through martial arts and meditation. Dr. Shakur recounts his early martial training, the unfolding of his psychic abilities, and the influential mystical experiences and people that influenced his life. Dr. Shakur reveals how he learned to be assertive and handle conflict, how he developed his own variation of Tonglen meditation, and the importance of trusting one's first thought. Dr. Shakur also shares his training in various religious and energetic systems, including Qigong, Yoga, Aikido, Buddhism, traditional Chinese medicine, and more. So without further ado, Dr. K. A. Shakur. Dr. K. A. Shakur, welcome to the podcast. Oh, thank you very much. I'm glad to be here and glad to be able to talk with you. And, to, you know, and hopefully um, we have a great discussion. I'm very um, appreciative to be on your show. I'm sure we will have an excellent discussion, and I'm very delighted to be talking with you. In fact, it was Dr. Nita Chenat Sang who suggested that we record this episode. So that is, um, that is the connection. And I'm, I'm sure it'll be very interesting. You know, I'd like to ask you, first of all, you've had a very fascinating life. And I'd like to ask you, first of all, about the, the context of your upbringing. I understand you are quite a sickly child who was frequently bullied, um, but also was prone to psychic experiences. So this is quite a, an interesting setup. Could you say something about um, what's the context of your upbringing? Where did you grow up uh, and, and, and what was the situation? I grew up in Detroit, Michigan, and since this is an international broadcast, um, Detroit, Michigan, actually is in the Midwest of the United States. It's surrounded by um, the Great Lakes, five Great Lakes, and Detroit is the largest city in Michigan. Um, I was born in 1955, and I was born in a middle, middle class um, indigenous Black family. Um, actually, um, I'm, um, I'm a Mohawk Indian, a Sephardic Jew. Um, and, um, and Native American on both sides. Um, I was raised primarily by my mother and definitely on my mother's side. Um, her father was from Spain and, um, my grandmother was Mohawk Indian, but also had ancestors came from Morocco and Algeria. I come from a family of educators. My, on my father's side, my great grandfather, um, was a, a medical doctor in 18, was it 1866, 65, he graduated from um, Howard University. My mother's father was a doctor of theology. And so I come from a family of educators and um, military uh, personnel, military persons. And so that was my situation. My mother was going through a divorce. My sister had passed away in 1953. She was going through a divorce when I was born. Um, I had learned that one cause of asthma was if women have trauma. My mother was definitely traumatized, as I understand, by my sister's passing. And going through the divorce was also traumatic because my grandfather, she came from a family that didn't believe in divorce based on his interpretation of scriptures. And as a result, I came out very sickly. So at that time, I was under oxygen tents sometimes for months at a time at different points. Um, I wheezed a lot. I had a serious asthma and bronchitis. I was a frail child. And as a result, I wasn't very assertive. And I was picked on um, by all the kids in the neighborhood. I was beat up a lot. My lunch money was taken away. You know, the typical story of the bullies. But in this case, the whole neighborhood bullied me because my mother was a single woman at that time. And in those days, a single woman was frowned upon. So my mother was like, it was almost like a, 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 um, a precursor to what you see in today's society. So she was a professional woman raising a child, um, which was uncommon at that time. You know, especially in the neighborhood I was in. Matter of fact, the uh, block club had got together and gave my mother money for what she had paid for the, uh, for the house she had paid for, for her to move off the neighborhood because they didn't want any single women in the neighborhood. So that was the mentality at that particular time. As a result, naturally because the, 
parents talked about my mother, the children then took it as more of an incentive to bully me. So that went on for uh, quite a while until I was around eight. And my uncle, who my mother's brother, my uncle who lived with me was a famous mortician. And um, one of the, one of the, his employees came out to the house one day and suggested to my mother that maybe I should take uh, martial arts. And so um, my mother said she thought about it. She was very overprotective of me and said, okay, the closest place to the house, we, we assigned him up. And it happened to be an Aikido dojo. So in 1963, in Midwest part of the United States, Aikido wasn't, those type of arts were very unheard of. You know, uh, you might have had this activity in California and New York which usually had the cutting edge type of practices, especially if you start talking about Eastern practices. But Aikido was almost unheard of. But for three or four years of my life, from the time I was eight to maybe around 12, I took Aikido three days a week. Naturally, I was the only uh, black kid in, in the group. And I was severely uh, 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 emotionally mistreated because they would never promote me. Matter of fact, I think I might have got a promotion the fourth year. I did the same three techniques every day, three days a week for three to four years. And um, later on, I, I realized the value in that after I became a teacher because old school teachers had, you know, were real strict on fundamental practices. Uh, but I also became introduced to Zen, Zen meditation. Um, because the teachers were Buddhist, as well as practicing Hatha Yoga. At that time, everything was unified, so it wasn't separate disciplines like you have today. Um, when you studied with a teacher, yoga or stretching and breathing was just a part of the, the, the syllabus, as well as meditation. So it was no separation today because, at least in America, maybe worldwide, or definitely in the Western world, um, what we call... Eastern arts or new age practices or whatever the term we want to use is a big industry. Every single aspect now is a money-making situation. But during those times, you had to learn all those things. Matter of fact, those were considered warm-ups and foundational practices. So that was my introduction um, to formally to Eastern practice. Now, Stepping back a little bit, my, as I stated before, my uncle was a mortician. I also stated I was severely, uh, uh, severe, had severe asthma and was sickly as a child. So my mother, um, if I had to stay home from school, uh, would take a lot of time let me go to the funeral home because she only had relatives watch me. There were no babysitters or anything like that, or she didn't believe in that. And I remember one day playing um, in the funeral home uh, with my GI Joes on the floor and there was the itty bitty casket. And I said, wow, I'm going to take that casket and turn it into a boat. I'm opened up, put my soldiers in. And when I opened up, it was a little baby in there a lot of, that was dead. It was like almost purple. And I was shocked. I was just totally shocked. And when I got home, I asked my mother, I said, I thought only old people die. She said, no, anybody can die. I said, anybody can die. She said, yeah, anybody can die. She said, babies can die. You can die. Anybody I said, at any point, we don't have any pre-warning. She said, we, we could die at any point. At that point, that was a very, very much a turning point in my life. And I didn't really realize it until later on in life when I reflect upon, reflect upon it. But that was, with, in my mind, something that bothered me because I asked her, I said, then what's the point of even us doing anything? Why do you talk about saving money and building up things? We can die at any point. It seemed like we should put more interest in than that, than, than spending time worrying about saving things and uh, saving money and, and pursuing things in the material world. So that was probably a major turning point at that young age of five. And I always wanted to figure out what was the point. And since my uncle was a mortician, many ministers in the, in the mortician business, you need to have good relationship with churches and other ecclesiastical organizations because that's where a lot of your business comes from. And so many ministers of many different faiths would come to the house as well as to the funeral home. 
And um, I read a lot. Being a sickly child, my mother read the Bible to me a lot. And then when I was around five or six, I was reading Plato and Aristotle. So I was reading way beyond my age level because I really, up until the Aikido practice, was, did, did, didn't have anything else to do but read. And I still read a lot now. When I walk around now, I still carry five or six books in a bag with me wherever I go. So reading has just been uh, almost like just a almost next to breathing to me but saying all that i would hear ministers laugh and joke sometime they would get a few drinks saying how they would say certain verses to the audience or to their congregation knowing that they were wrong and laughing and i was horrified one time when a minister told me he said we don't know whether god exists or not we just tell people that because that's what they wanted to hear so now that was the second defining moment that I can think of. Now I was really disturbed at this point, coming from a home that was highly religious and spiritual. Um, and I had a cousin who lived with me also. Uh, he was a, being black, but he was super light-skinned. And so back during those days, you have something called passing, where a black person, if they look white, they could get jobs. And he actually was a geologist and had worked for Standard Oil. He had been in China during the time of Sun Yet Sin. And so he lived with me too. So as a child, we'd hear a lot of stories about China. He was an atheist. He didn't believe in God. He was a scientist. And so I lived in the house being the only child with a lot of educated people that had a lot of discussions from the atheistic end of my cousin and then the super spiritual end of my mother and my, and my uncle. And so that would become interesting. So I told my mother at 10, I didn't believe in none of this because it was the, what I would hear at church. And we might remember now, even though my mother was Native American, they were Jews, they weren't allowed being black to practice those things at that time. So it had to be hidden. Uh, a lot of this wasn't told to me until I got older as far as my uh, specifics of my ancestry. Um, but I told her I didn't believe in any of it because it was lies. And, and I would hear ministers purposely say things that were wrong. And at that time, I had a very good memory. So I almost memorized this all kinds of verses in the Bible. I memorized Roman history. I read um, uh, Edward Gibbons' Decline in the Fall of the Roman Empire. I probably it was three volume books, a three volume set. It was a thousand pages. I probably read that three times by the time I was 10. And so I was very much in the Roman and Greek history at that, at that particular time, at that particular time, as well as biblical uh, information. And so I told unless I have, I said to myself, unless I have an experience, I'm not going to uh, believe in, in this type of thing. Now, the experiences I did have were seeing disincarnated souls. I could see those things from the time I was, can remember myself. My aunt was like that. My mother had psychic ability. Everybody I knew was like that. My father was like that, but he used it for gambling. Okay. He didn't, you know, so he used, he could see numbers. He could see bets and I could see things, but nobody could explain to me the whys and why nots. Many times people would pass away in the family and different members would say, so, um, uncle so-and-so or cousin so-and-so came to me and told me the night before that they were gonna pass away, but they were in states far away, hundreds of miles away. And I would hear stories about people showing up in their full bodies talking to them. And so I would ask, well, how can somebody show up and talk to you and they six or 700 miles away? But no one could explain it to me, but people would talk about this. Now, remember, I come from a family where everyone basically was college educated, most of them had science degrees and what have you. So it wasn't like, you know, uh, they had understanding of, of science and the Western philosophy and what have you, but it, was, it wasn't uncommon for people to talk like this, not just in my household, but in my community. Uh, so my mother told me the night before I was born, I mean, the, before I was born, the month before that, my, my, her father, my grandfather came to her and talked to her and said that he was gonna pass away the next day, but that he would be back soon. So he died on July 12th, on August 12th, I was born. And my mother said I was somewhat like him. And as I've gone through life, I can see a lot of similar characteristics, you know? And so I would hear a lot of these types of stories. So the concept of rebirth and all this kind of 
situation that I learned about when I started studying Buddhism and, and, uh, and Vedic uh, literature uh, then began to confirm how I grew up. So my first real academic understanding was reading an autobiography of a yogi by Paramahasa Yogananda when I was 13. That became like the first book in English that began to talk about astral realms, what happened um, with Sri Yukastra reappearing, uh, various folks reappearing, being more than one place at one time, all these types of things. And a lot of things that I experienced growing up, now I was getting answers, you know, that made sense. So I remember telling myself when I was like 13 or 14 that my goal in life was to be a yogi, you know, even though I didn't know all the particulars, but I knew that that's what I wanted to do ultimately. And so that in synopsis can somewhat give you an idea what my upbringing was. In the meantime, I still did, um, by the time I was 12, I became very physically strong. So I played baseball, I played basketball, I ran cross country. So, and I did things and I also played music from the time I was eight. I started off playing classical music. I sang opera um, and these types of things. Now, um, I had a piano teacher by the name of Sister Marie Constance. Um, and so this was another subtle influence on spirituality. Sister Marie Constance lived to be 95 years old. In the last 20 years of her life, she went into seclusion and, and almost it's like what happens with the, um, many of the yogis. She, her whole life was in seclusion. They would just put food under the door. But that's the first time I had heard about that. But she was my piano teacher. And I always remember she had her rosary. And it was real unique when I think back on how she used to teach me piano because I remember half my lesson wasn't even about piano. She would just talk to me. But she always had those rosaries, rosaries going. And Sister Marie Constance suddenly had an influence upon me. Yet later on, that was at Mary Grove College. Later on, I taught at Mary Grove College for 13 years. I taught yoga there and I taught Tai Chi. And um, they told me that Sister Marie Constance was up in that, that building there. And I think she eventually passed away during the years I was teaching there, but they said she was in seclusion. They devoted her whole life to just um, communion with God. And so that had a subtle influence upon my psyche also in my, in my being. Um, speaking about Mary Grove College, which was a Catholic college, um, I had 13 nuns that were my students, one, several of them becoming um, actually instructors in Tai Chi. But I remember, so this is now I'm bending the story about how they talked about Buddhism a lot, you know, that they were very much um, influenced by Buddhism. So now at 13, and so that was an influence. It's almost like Buddhism followed me wherever I went in life. When I was um, in high school, I mentioned I played basketball, so I'm at I'm up to high school now. So I'm about 15, and one day we didn't have basketball practice, maybe 15 or 16. We didn't have basketball practice, so I went to the main library, and they had a um, reference section where you couldn't take books out. And there was a book there called The Nine Ways of Bone by Snell Grove, which naturally I have now. But at that time, it was a hardback and you couldn't take it out. For some reason, I was always attracted to that book. And I would go and sit there and just read like, half the stuff, I, half the terminology I didn't understand. And I would look up as much as I could. But I always was reading through that book constantly. So one day, uh, a guy comes in, a black guy comes in dressed up uh, like Superfly is the best way I can put it. And he said, he said, boy, you don't know nothing about what you're reading. And so I look at him because of how he looked and formed the opinion that he was some drug dealer or some type of pimp. And I said, you don't know anything about any of this at all. He said, you think you, I don't know anything about this. He said, I want you to come with me across the street to this apartment and I'm going to show you something. And for some reason I went with him against totally the way I was raised, but by that time, I had had many years of the keto trading. So I'm like, this guy is not going to do nothing to me, you know. So anyway, I went over there. And when we walked into his apartment, the whole room transformed. And I was in Tibet. And outside um, the uh, courtyard, you could see the various temples. And this guy had transformed into a, like a statue, like doing all types of mudras. 
And so it was almost like something like one of those movies you see, like Back to the Future or something. I mean, it was like, I don't even know how to explain it. So I asked, I said, who are you and what's going on? And how do you know these mudras? And all he said to me is that you think you know the truth now, but when you get older, you'll know the complete truth. Now it's time for you to go home because your mother's waiting on you. So he takes me downstairs to the bus. The bus shows up. When I turn around to thank him, nobody's there. But I never really talked about it. I've only, only recently, in the last two or three years, that I talk about this. But I never talked about it the majority of my life. I never even mentioned to anybody because nobody would probably believe it. But truly, it happened. And let me uh, state that um, I never, I, during that time period, or any time period, I wasn't taking LSD or smoking any type of drugs or any kind of medications. I just want to say this uh, for anybody that's listening. So there was no hallucination. This was, I've had a lot of experiences like this, but this was one definitely that accounts to um, Buddhism. And so seeing people, seeing individuals that appear like humans, and disappearing in front of you. And this has happened with me, with other people with me that witnessed it. They didn't even have the same belief system that I had. So those paranormal type of situations are what people call paranormal, to me are not unusual. It's just a part of everyday life. And only because we read about these, um, uh, read about this in, in, in materials about various yogis and masters and what have you, um, you know, it becomes, you know, we, we talk about it in no sense, but to me, these are situations that happen all the time with people. And what I learned through talking with people that a lot of people experience situations like this, but they're afraid to talk about it because people would think that something's wrong with them. But uh, because of my orientation and how I am, a lot of times people don't have any problem expressing what we would call paranormal. To me, it's just normal. It's just a part of life. It's just another aspect of life, but we've been conditioned to believe in only a certain set of uh, material and anything else that's beyond that is that can't be proven or used by or proven by the scientific method, then it's not really real. So um, back to the story. Um, I played music. I graduated undergrad school when I was 19. I had a degree in philosophy and degree, degree in um, psychology from the University of Michigan. But um, I was going to a PhD program in psychology, but I decided not to go into it because I thought that um, learning about the um, eugenics concepts of, philosophy, of psychiatry and philosophy and, and, and um, of psychiatry and psychology, I decided I didn't want to go into behavior modification programs that were basically available to me at that time. So I left the uh, PhD program and um, I went to work in corporate America, as well as um, shortly after that, I started playing music based upon a vision, uh, pop music, reggae and funk, and um, had a lot of experiences playing music for 23 years, uh, traveling around the country, Midwest and East Coast primarily. And every city I went to, um, Nationally, drug culture is very predominant in, in pop music. Um, I wasn't involved in that. I would always find various um, workshops to go to New when I'm in New York and Chicago, other cities. And so I developed relationships with different gurus, different teachers, different centers. And since we were basically touring all the time, or quite frequently, I was able to get teachings and develop relationships, not only just in Detroit, but also in Chicago, um, as I mentioned, New York, Philadelphia, Chicago. And so a lot of times when people look at my resume, it's like, how did you study with all these different people? That's how I was able to study with a lot of different people. And a lot of my teachers, um, I studied privately with them. So I wasn't in a lot of group classes. So I will go back to like, now I'm up to like 1980, 81, 82, um, we finally get a teacher by the name of Gelly Rinpoche, who was a gay Lu gay Lama, uh, one of the Dalai Lamas, 14 Dalai Lamas, one of his tutors. He comes to Ann Arbor, Michigan. And um, a lady by the name of Sandy and Aura, uh, was, uh, I think Aura Glazer was her last name. They hosted um, this Lama to come to Ann Arbor. 
And so for like two years, like 13 to maybe 13 to 15 of us that were studying with him, because at that time, Tibetan Buddhism, at least in the Midwest, still wasn't as big as it is now, um, as far as popularity uh, in, the, uh, in America, but specifically in the Midwest. So that's where I got my first um, uh, refuge and um, tantric initiation, Bodhisattva initiation, Manjusri, Tara, all, all those uh, particular um, empowerments and what have you. Um, and so the study in a house, basically six, seven hours a day, four hours a day with, with 10 people at the most is a whole another level of teaching. It's almost like a private instruction and the kind of communications and the kind of questions you can ask and, and how the group develop. And um, there was a gentleman by the name of Robert Thibodeau who had the, um, the second largest metaphysical bookstore in the United States, um, actually was the person that actually made me aware of it. And mentioning Bob Thibodeau, he had a very profound influence. His bookstore had a very profound influence upon me because he had just about every kind of book you could imagine in English. And I bought just about every book that he, he one time said, man, I know you're going to heaven just from the amount of books you've bought because I bought so many books. And then with, in many cases, resell them back to the store because I had just so many books. But speaking on the subject of Tibetan Buddhism and Buddhism, my early influences were naturally E. Evan Wentz. I was reading his books in high school. I still, matter of fact, even had my original copies of uh, Tibetan Yoga and Secret Doctrines and Great Liberation. Milarepa, and naturally the most famous book that everybody was reading back in the late 60s and 70s was the, uh, the Tibetan Book of the Dead, at least that bird, that was the only available version in English at that time. Naturally, there are many that are out here now. And so you had those books. You had Alexander David Neal um, that was sort of like biographical. Sometimes I wonder where how much of that was fiction, but maybe it was biographical. You had another person definitely that was um, fictional was Lop Singh Rampa or an English writer that went by that name. So we read all his books and then we were reading a uh, German Lama by the name of Lama Govinden who had foundations of Tibetan Buddhism, Way of the White Cloud. I think he had one called Tibetan Stupas. Um, so I read all those books. So those were the big, yeah, C.C. Chang's book on, on the Six Yogas of Naropa. And so those were the available books in English at that time. I mean, we're talking about the 70s that were available to read. Then the Dalai Lama's book, The Opening of the Wisdom Eye came out. We read that. And then naturally, um, we get up to 79 and 80. And I was very much influenced by Keith Dalton. Uh, Doman's book, um, Sky Dancer, um, which is a very profound book to me. Love that book. And they probably bought that book and given it to a number of people and suggest that book even today for people to read. So those were like the early books that influenced me before more llamas, uh, Tibetan llamas in themselves began to translate books and or people would translate books for them if we get more, 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 um, I don't know. Some people have problems with Wences. A lot of English um, historians uh, translations of books. So we have a, a whole level of different books with Dr. Nasty, um, Dr. Thurman and um, uh, Nicholson and there are others um, that, um, that have books out that I've been influenced by. So I'll stop at that point to see if you have any questions for me. <laughs> Fascinating. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, I do have some questions, actually. I'm curious, what was the de denomination? You said your mother had a doctorate in theology and your uncle also was um, uh, religious. What was the denomination? Well, my, her father had, had a doctorate in theology. He was oh. Episcopalian. He's beside an elder in, uh, in the Episcopalian faith. Okay. And uh, my mother was, had a degree in biology. Okay, but she had to end up teaching second grade because at that time they didn't allow uh, people of color to teach biology. My mother graduated in 1949 from Wayne State University. She eventually went back and got two master's degrees in, um, and, um, in, in psychology. 
um, and came short of her PhD, but never completed her thesis for that. Um, but my grandfather was, um, uh, like I said, doctor of theology, her father and my, and my father's great, my father's grandfather was a, was a medical doctor. And I'm curious, can you say something more about your Aikido teacher? What kind of a person is teaching Aikido in 63 in the Midwest? That seems like a very interesting person. And what effect did the Aikido training, if any, have on the bullying? How, how did that, the bullying and the assertiveness and your physical health and so on, did that begin to improve? Well, first of all, um, I'll speak about the physical health. The Aikido practice, which most people from me were doing, first of all, we had to do almost like 15 minutes of how, what, what is now known as Hatha Yoga, they, we just, they just call them stretching exercises, but it's what is what we call Hatha Yoga, sun exercises and all the various cobra poses and all that. So we had to do that. Then we had to do key breathing, a whole lot of breathing exercises. And so um, I used to always ask, what does key mean? What does key mean? They say, well, you, you know, you're too young to understand. It's just an energy. And I tried to look it up. 1963, it wasn't a lot of information on what key was. And, you know, I had some Britannica encyclopedias and I'm trying to look. And finally, I found out, I found a definition of chi. They say, well, chi has to do with chi and chi has to do with Tai Chi and that has to do with prana and that has to do with yoga. So then that, that directed my mind in, in trying to find all the information I could, especially probably most, the most available information at that time was on yoga more so than uh, Tai Chi. But anyway, to go back to, the Aikido practice, it, 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 you know, just through the breathing and the nature of the exercise, the internal exercise that strengthened my body and strengthened my lungs and began to detox uh, impurities out of my system. And I was training three days a week. Now, the man that started brought the Aikido to, and this was Yoshinkan Aikido, so to be very specific, um, was a man by the name of Eddie Moore, who was an African-American. He was actually an underworld figure, which I didn't know that at the time. But he had a lot of money and he went to Japan and he brought, uh, uh, eventually brought a man by the name of Kushida to um, Michigan and had him under a lifetime contract until um, Mr. Moore passed away. My specific teacher, but before Kushida got there, there was a man by the name of um, Jerome Hilton. And uh, he was the actual, my actual teacher back in 63, 64. And um, all I can say is this, you know, and I have to give my mother a lot of credit um, because I was treated so poorly because of being black and being the only black person in the class. Um, I didn't want to go. After, it was a period of time. I just didn't want to do any of it. My mother said, you have to go because this is how life is. You can't stop because of how you being, were being treated. And so she made me go. Sometimes she would go and just sit there and watch the practice. As a matter of fact, eventually she began to come and just sit and watch the practices, but she, she would not let me miss a class and I had to go because she said, you can't be a quitter. And so just that in itself, um, just that teaching in itself has had it so that I've never really quit in anything that I've done, even though it's taken a long time to accomplish it. I don't have a defeatist attitude. And sometimes uh, certain objectives have taken a long time as far as how we measure time, like years, but I don't, I don't give up on things or quit. So if not anything, it developed that aspect. And so that translated into me getting through, uh, at the time I went to University of Michigan Dearborn, I was a part of the first group of minorities that were in the college because uh, the federal government has sued University of Michigan for not allowing minority, minority students in. Of the, I think it was 400 and some student minorities that came in, only six graduated in that first round and I was a part of the first six. I said, no way, a lot of people left the college, a lot of people flunked out, a lot of people transferred. I didn't allow that to happen. I had a profound experience because I was on the basketball team there. I was the only black on the team on their first team that they had. This is a division, uh, NCAA division three. We played at a Bible college. And I remember Coach M Mathers telling me, Smathers telling me as we got close to the arena, it was an away game. I guess he couldn't figure out how to tell me this. He said, they're going to file you out the game as soon as you get there. And I said, they're going to file me out the game. How are they going to file me out the game? He said, because 
their version of the Bible is that black people are cursed and all this, and they don't want no black person playing on the court. So we get to the gym, we get to the place. I guess the, 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 this gym held, I would say two to 3,000 people. That's what I would say. And um, within two, two or three minutes, the referees fouled me out the game. I was standing at the foul line and they just came up and said, foul, 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 five fouls, I was out. And I sat on the bench and for the rest of the game, the whole arena, other than the people on my team for shouting every kind of uh, racist term that you can think of. Now you have to, to put this in context. They were still lynching. I mean, they still, they were still lynching people. They still lynch people. They were lynch, still lynching people at that time because one message you would always hear growing up in a black neighborhood is don't get caught in a white neighborhood because white folks will lynch you, you know, and Michigan had at that time had the highest, membership with the KKK uh, in America. A lot of people say that, you know, talk about the South being um, racist, but the North, in my opinion, might be, the Northern part of the United States might be more racist or de definitely as equally as racist as the South. Being that said, the coach wanted me to go into the locker room and I said, I'm not going to no locker room because the police, the guards, and everybody else were calling me names. I said, they might take me out in the woods somewhere and lynch me, Never, you never see me again. So I sat on the bench, and I went to a medita meditation where I learned in the keto. I just went into stillness. We call it mindfulness now in, in our system, Shanae, um, Shamata. But I sat and eventually, probably in the last two or three minutes, the people stopped because they see that I wouldn't be affected by it. But I went into a state that eventually I just harmonized if I was to explain it now. Um, the fear went away. I just sat there. And when I walked out, my teammates all got around me and they shielded me. And I actually felt bad for them. I probably felt worse for them than I felt for myself. Uh, there again, it's only been in later years since I've been down here that I even reflect upon that incident because I had repressed it or forgotten about it. And it only had been in maybe the last two or three years with all these other events going on around the country that I remembered that I experienced that event. And um, anyway, I felt bad for them because they were protecting me and they were in a room of, of like I say, two or 3,000 white folks calling them the end lover. And um, I just felt bad for them. And they, they, they felt bad. And I told them there's no reason for you to feel, feel bad. But what I can say out of that experience, it didn't make me have opinions because of how I was raised and I guess how I am. Because I experienced that, I didn't like what those people did, but it didn't, I didn't have like no attitude, like I dislike all white people and all that kind of stuff. I realized that those were those people, you know? And that, like I said, I felt bad for my coach and I felt bad because he, he didn't know how to tell me. And it was really uncomfortable. We won the game, but it was really uncomfortable for my whole team to be in that situation. And um, cause they could easily not have done that, you know, to protect me. So that was an experience. When you talk about what a keto practice did, I say those types of things laid the foundation for everything else, every other kind of challenge and what have you that I've experienced in life. You also mentioned a, a lack of assertiveness at a young age. And how did that particular aspect transform? Well, my mother taught me not to fight. So I was very passive as a child. You know, I didn't like to fight. I don't like the idea of fighting now. I don't like conflict. You know, even though people see me now and they see my personality, it's like, man, this guy is really aggressive and all that. I mean, naturally through training and what have you, you learn to survive. And I've had to raise children in Detroit doing violent errors and everything else. So you learn that. But by nature, I'm not into fighting people or being aggressive. And it hurts me and it saddens me e even when I hear the news about all the kinds of things that go on. It really, really bothers me. You know, it really, really bothers me to no end all kinds of violence, not just racial violence, but violence against women, kidnapping, just all the kind of stuff that go on, you know? And so um, assertiveness was I didn't like to fight. I didn't like to speak up for myself. I wasn't. And so the Aikido practice helped with being assertive as far as just my stance, how you walk, how you speak to people, giving people space, not feeding into people if they start cussing at you or talking a certain way, 
that you know when to, if you have to use that kind of energy, but many times not to use that energy diffuses it. You know, so Aikido is like, uh, uh, means to spirit, spirit harmony. So you harmonizing with the person to bring them in harmony with the universe. That's how it was explained. And that's basically how I still use those principles. You know, so, um, I mean, I've been in situations where I'm walking down the street and somebody come up and say, hey man, give me some money. And I say, I was getting ready to ask you for some money, give me some money. And they look crazy like that. Like they, they expect me to say that. So I'm harmonizing, it diffuses the situation. I've been in other situations where a guy came up on me. This is in, these are Detroit situations. And I asked the guy, I said, do you have life insurance? He said, why are you asking me that? I said, because you step one step more, I'm going to kill you like that. And he backed off. So there's a matter of knowing what to say, being still enough to understand the environment of knowing how to defuse situations without having to engage in violence towards another person or being a victim of violence. So I can say the Aikido training definitely um, served as the foundation of that. And actually other trainings have that I've learned and what have you have had, I've built on top of that. Yeah, fascinating. Um, I'm curious, one more question about this period of, of, of life that you've covered so far, about this psychic dimension. And that seems to be something that you had a talent for or a gift for, even at a young age, and something it seems from what you've described runs in your family, or certainly was, was everywhere. You said it was happening all the time. Um, in your community and around you. So I'm curious about that. How did that aspect develop? I mean, a lot of the systems that you went on to train in have specific methods for cultivating, uh, uh, disciplining, or using those psychic um, dimensions, I suppose, uh, in different ways. Not everyone accesses those, those aspects of those systems, but did this uh, natural gift um, did you run it through those systems? What what was the unfolding of that particular aspect of your life? All I can say is I grew up like that. And, and most of the people I knew, not just in my family, but in my community were like that. That's the first thing. And then I can also say that in my family, 70% of the persons in my family are women. I also mentioned that I'm primarily Native American and Native American, and it's not just Native American people, but Native American people tend to deal in dreams being able to interpret dreams that was very heavy growing up about what what did you dream what was your dream about you know that was kind of, you every day i woke up it's like what, what what did you dream about so dreams was very much a part of the culture um being around my mother and my aunts and cousins being around females a lot women a lot i learned to Developed that quality of, of sensitivity to a great degree. My Aikido teacher at one point separated me from the rest of the class and he made me train with a woman he, for six months. He said, you can't train with nobody else. You only can train with this woman. And naturally, we speak about this time period. So naturally, everybody laughed at me because you got to train with the woman over there. But the woman threw me all over the place. And he said, something I need you to learn. You know, so what I can say is being around the female element, the mother element, and I can probably tell you other things that happened in my life, um, helped develop that even more. My mother had a lot of crystal in the house. She had crystal lamps, crystal ashtrays, crystal chandeliers. And I remember as a kid, she said, you look into this crystal and you'd be able to develop the, the ability of having uh, uh, premonitions um, that you can enhance that more. But then when I asked her more about it, she said, don't ask me no more about it. Just look into the crystal. So for a while, um, when I was a kid, I'm talking about five and six years old, I, it was a certain a crystal ashtray and she had a crystal lamp and I, I would sit there and just, just uh, um, stare into it. And so therefore, I developed the ability where I could see things before they could happen. And a lot of stuff like that. You know, my mom was like that. I mean, if I would start talking about something and people she didn't even know, she started telling me all about it. I said, you don't even know these people. How do you know? And I mean, so it, it, I didn't, it was just a normal part of life. Naturally, once you uh, start, start studying yoga formally, studying with gurus formally, learning all the terminology and what have you, then I could put some context to it. But a lot of people are like this. 
you know, women in particular like this. And I can also say, um, and I mean, people can argue back and forth about this, you know, misogynist, misogynism has been in the world for a very, very long time. But I'll say from the external appearance, at least in the neighborhood I grew up in, I never saw, I never heard of like domestic violence or, uh, or people talking down to women condescendingly. These have, I, didn't, I didn't see none of that kind of stuff until I was like out of the house, maybe like 19 or 20 years old. You know, the only stories we heard that if a man abused a woman, we heard a couple stories that uh, of women killing their husbands or killing their boyfriends for doing that. That's what we heard. We didn't, and there were only two or three stories like that. You know, so I think there was, even if you listen to the culture of the music at that time, because music is a reflection, at least in my opinion, of the culture, the, the types of music, more love songs and more adoration towards women and, and women towards men, there was a different attitude, maybe, some would argue, but at least on the surface, where today there's a whole, at least all out in the open, where there's a total dislike and hatred and to, the out, the, to the outset of we have, you know, a, a thousand, hundreds of thousands of rape cases and murder cases towards women in this country every year. And that's what's reported. That's not even dealing with what's not reported. You know, so going back to the psychic aspect, women are mothers and so the natural i mean everyone that i know of you know i mean there's some test to uh persons but the majority of people 99.9 percent .9 of our population come from the womb so it only makes sense that the mother has the mother now the mother has the ultimate knowledge of, of things so we have what i call intuitive knowledge or just knowing and then there's academic knowing but mothers just know. And so that's what we try to attain in, in the spiritual practice where we just uh, attain the state that we are working out of the Ajna to where we just know things. Naturally on the material level, we have to go through the academic sense to be able to use a scientific method or a proof method when we deal with other folks. But I was always taught to feel, you know, you have to feel it. My mother and my aunts and grandmother would always talk to me about you have to feel, trust what you feel, trust it, trust your feelings, trust the first thought, even beyond that, even being more specific. And I can say I probably wouldn't be talking to you today if I didn't follow that method. I probably, if I didn't follow my first thought, there are probably too many situations I probably, I would have been dead by now, by not following that. And you hear people say that all the time. I knew I was supposed to do this, but I didn't do it. And, you know, you hear it all the time. You know, so we all have this. It's not no unique thing. Every human has. We all endowed with the same, the same qualities. It's just a matter, matter of whether we are encouraged in that way. So when I used to see disincarnated spirits, they didn't tell me that was my imagination or that don't exist. They, they would ask me, well, what did you see? And I'd say, well, I saw somebody look like this and they described them. And they would say, oh, that's your great, great grand uncle or that's this, that, and the other, or that's a demonic spirit. Don't pay no attention to it. It can't hurt you, but don't follow it. So I was never discouraged in that way. Like that's your imagination or stuff like that don't exist. I think that's really the difference between those. Today, I would say different between a person that has the ability versus a person that doesn't is because of how we were educated. And so naturally doing spiritual practices and mantras and all the other kinds of technical practices later on just enhance certain things even more. But the innate thing was always there. Did that, did that somewhat answer the question? Yeah, certainly it did. Yeah, very interesting. I know I said that was the last question about that period of time, but I actually have uh, more are coming <laughs> to my mind. Okay, that's fine. Know. That's fine. Um, could you say a little about the, that series of, uh, you know, when you were traveling a lot over these 23 years playing music, um, you said you studied, that was a period of time where you were able to study with a lot of different teachers. I'm wondering if you could say something about some of those significant teachers, some of the teachers that were significant to you at that time. Well, I start here first. Um, we played in Chicago a lot, and um, during that time, I also had a day job too. So a lot of times, I went out on the road on the weekend. 
okay? Because music business is up and down. So a lot of times you have to maintain uh, a, another job also. But um, there was a time I, uh, my band spent a lot of time in Illinois and um, in Chicago specifically, and then we were playing outlining cities. And there was a Kagyu temple there. And on the off days, I would go to that temple. In those days when you went in, they just tell you to sit and you would sit, you had to sit, the sessions were like two hours long. It's a little bit different now, but back then it was like, you had to sit for two hours. And so you sit there for two hours, I'm like, man. But eventually I had a profound experience one time sitting those two hours. And um, after I had that profound experience, I began to understand things about the mind. Okay, so that's one thing. Now dealing with the individual, Professor Visitation was a great, uh, matter of fact, uh, A&E did a special on him. He was American treasure in um, V-Jitsu or Jiu-Jitsu and V-Jitsu Tay. But he was a very mystical person and he came to visit me and there's a discrepancy on his age, but he told me he was 91 when he came to my house. And um, he also said I was the only person out of the New York area that he ever came to visit. So he came, he stayed at my house, stayed there for three, a whole weekend. But the amazing thing was we did a seminar and um, there was a, some young people there in their twenties. And um, they say, oh old man, you don't know what you're talking about. And there was this, this guy was real proficient in monkey kung fu. He could just do all types of things. And I actually saw Professor B just raise his hand. I was standing right next to him. And I felt his energy and he paralyzed this guy and the guy couldn't move for over 15 or 20 minutes. And then Professor V held a, held a whole lecture and then he snapped his hand and the guy moved again. You know, so I was very much influenced by Professor V, just those experiences with him. And um, he talked to me about the importance of internal practice because I was doing a lot of hard practice at that time as far as uh, martial training. Um, jumping over cars, rolling on some men. He told me to stop doing all that. He said everything was internal, only practice internal. And he said that um, that would, um, I could practice into however long I'm on the planet, but if I'm 90 years old, he threw all my students around. He said, you see what I'm doing? And like, he seemed like the guy never went to sleep. You know, he's up all night and they're like, man, he was throwing us around. Cause my living room, I had transformed into like a mini dojo at that time. And I had, you know, it was all matted. And he was throwing my students, my personal students that were there around nearly all night. And um, that was a profound experience. Um, basically what I can say, I would go to a lot of seminars and I developed, I was practicing a lot of Aikido, the Bond Street Dojo, the New York Aikikai, um, a gentleman by the name of Felix Barrios at the Azan Rue Jiu Jitsu. And he said, yeah, you like, at that time I was a fourth degree black belt. And he said, yeah, well, he said, now you moving into what it's really about. I said, well, what do you mean? He said, this is the physical stuff. This ain't what it is. It's a spiritual aspect. That's the real training. This is just a preliminary. Um, so those are some, some situations of where I was influenced by um, uh, various teachers in, in various locations. And I would go to a lot of different seminars, you know, you in New York and you see some guru is giving a workshop here and there and what have you. And so I would go to a lot of those places. I flew to England in um, 1985, 84, 85, and I stayed in a gay Luke monastery. Um, there was a uh, teacher there by Lama Wanchuk, what's that his name? But anyway, he... Um, he had a private audience with me once and he wanted to know what I knew as far as um, rechanneling energy in the body and tantricism or rechanneling the, the, uh, the, the semen and all that stuff. And I told him, he told me that he said, well, you, you, you have, you, he said, you understand it. And then we were talking about various things and um, I was talking to him like he was my age. And he said, um, do you know how old I am? I said, no. He said, I'm 70 years old. I said, I'm like, 70 years old. Yeah. So what what I the most profound thing I got from him was that he said he saw the Chinese shoot down his whole family. He said, I was a little kid, three years old, but I was real little. I was hiding in a barrel. And the Chinese came in and shot my whole family down. 
And so I asked him, I said, you don't hate Chinese? He said, no. I said, you didn't have no bad dreams? He said, no. I said, you didn't, you didn't have no kind of trauma, no PTSD, none of that kind of stuff, no anxiety, no depression. He said, no. And he had this gigantic smile on his face. He said, I don't have any hatred towards them. And that was a very defining moment. I actually met a, a person that experienced that amount of, uh, of hatred and trauma to see your whole family shut down and for him not to have any kind of hatred towards them was very, uh, uh, struck me very much. I mean, that, that probably, I mean, that stayed with me to this day, you know, and um, I do certain practices. Matter of fact, I purposely will read and look at uh, news accounts or video accounts of uh, violence that goes on. And um, I sit and I, I, I do Tong Men or I transform that within myself, you know, because it's so easy to get triggered because when I have to talk to other people, I have to, I can't tell, or I will not tell a person something that I myself can't do because I consider that to be a, a false, a, being false. So Lama Wan Chuck, if I'm pronouncing his name correctly, had a profound effect upon me. Could you go into a little more detail about this practice of Tong Len, how you use it uh, in in this particular way, looking at news stories of, of uh, violence and so on? Could you kind of give a, a bit of a walkthrough of, of that? Well, it's the same thing. You know, I look at that person, I visualize that person and I draw, the, um, I visualize drawing the negativity out of that person through their crown chakra, through the through the heart chakra, or any any of the higher chakras, but probably the crown that I draw it out, and then um, I draw I draw it out into space, and then I explode it through my third eye. So I kind of have my own modified tongue then, and then I draw in energy and I exhale and send light, either using uh, golden color or light color into that person and bathe that person in love and compassion, you know? And um, then a lot of times I go in places, like if I'm sitting in a um, bus stop or in, the, in a train station or in an airport, which I don't take planes a lot, but if I'm going to uh, pick someone up or if I'm in any place where a lot of people, I do, I do a tongue limb while I'm pulling the energy out of everybody that's in, it, in the place and then sending light to all those people and praying for all those people if I'm traveling. So I do it a, a lot of times, you know, I do it a lot, you know, to try to transform the environment, you know, as well as, you know, doing prayers and what have you for sentient beings. Um, I do it with animals too, but I probably do it more so with human beings. You know, I, I've experimented doing it with, 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 with plant life and what have you too, but I've only experimented with that, but primarily with, with, the, uh, with humans. And can you say something more about that transformational experience you had sitting in the Kagyu Center? You said that you had an experience there that uh, was quite profound, and then you, you learned a lot about the mind, or you understood a lot about the mind after that experience. What happened? The best way I can explain it to you is this. <clears throat> it's like being in a newsroom, where, you know, if you're in a newsroom, at least the old newsroom, they had information coming in constantly. It's like there's this voice, if I can put it that way, that is always the same, that always knows. And then there's these two other voices, one that says, one that I call it left channel and right channel. And it became very, it became very um, clear to me how that works. And that's the best way I can describe it. And since I became in touch with that, <clears throat> um, I just know how to get in touch with that voice, uh, that that thing that all that all that knower that always knows. I put it that way. It's hard to describe this, but that's the best way I can describe it. Yeah, very cool. Thank you. Okay, I want to ask about how you got into Chinese medicine. I know you have a clinical doctorate in acupuncture and oriental medicine, and have practiced that for many years. So I'd like to ask you about that. But first, I have to. I can't not ask this question. You know, I could ask a hundred more questions about what you said so far. So I'm, this is me being restrained. Um, speaking of restraint, what did what was it that you understood about semen retention and that tantric that tantric uh, subject that you were discussing with Wang Chuk Rinpoche? 
Well, this is much. <clears throat> this is much that I'm gonna say about it. Um, I formally started. I would say that the idea of being able to reach channel semen and all that stuff, I was able to do that. But I'm 66. I was able to do that by the time I was 25. I studied with a um, a shy bite teacher um, that was as far as formal practice. And then um, I just practiced it a lot. But what I'll say about it is this. It has to do with bodhicitta. It has to do with love. Um, you can practice all these type of techniques and, and this, that, and the other and all that from my personal experience. But the real, the real retention, if you want to call it, that has to do with love. If a person doesn't have love, um, genuine love towards their partner and general love towards uh, people, then it becomes very difficult um, to retain the tig lee, if I can call it that. That that's what I would say. It has to do with a general attitude, and 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 the few students I have had that I do teach, uh, the first thing is 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 having reverence towards your mom and any kind of uh, 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 issues that one has with their mother for that to be resolved. Actually, that's what Gellig Rinpoche had taught us before he would teach us. He said, if you got issues, the first thing you have to do is have love towards the mother. If you got issue with the mother, that has to be worked out first. And none of the other rest of the stuff is really going to work, you know? So that's what I'll say about um, the semen aspect. I know that that becomes a, a, a big interest point, especially with people in the West, because of the sexual aspect that's, you know, with sex involved with stuff. And because we are mostly conditioned under under uh, Semitic religions that deal with a lot of guilt and even even some of the um, Vedic systems too, where there's a lot of guilt and relationship and condemnation of sexuality of women and all these kinds of things. So naturally when when you look at the spiritualization and the, uh, of sexuality and of the body and what have you, that becomes a great interest to many of us here in the West. And so, and, and a lot of it's been distorted. There's so much distorted stuff out here is the reason why I won't even talk about it like that. I talk about people uh, dealing with the issues with their mom and dealing with um, a lot a lot of practice, prostrations. Um, prostrations are very, very important in, in strengthening uh, that kundalini, that spine, especially those of us that are that identify in the male body. That, that's very, very important. So I talk about that aspect first, um, rather than getting into uh, a lot of what I call pop tantricism, you know? And so that's why a lot of time, I had a friend of mine trick me one time. He was a friend of mine for 30 years. I was supposed to come up and talk about yoga and he advertised me as a tantric teacher and I got really upset. And that was probably the only time I, because he advertised me, I talked about it. Other than that, I keep it kind of hidden, you know, uh, because of the, like I say, it's so easy for people to misuse it, and um, and it is misused or misunderstood. And a lot of times, people's minds trick them into thinking that they they they. Well, you already know it's tricky, and everybody won't feel that they're at this higher level and they they ready to do all this kind of stuff. And it's a lot of foundational practices because it's based what the teachers have taught me and what I can say from my life is that the the, the foundation. I guess we would say in, in Tibetan Buddhism, the nandros and the and, and what having the guru yoga is probably the most important aspect, you know. So when I go back to your keto training, like doing the same three techniques for four years, the same thing over and over again, no variation, no nothing. It's the same thing over and over again. And then my Hatha yoga teacher was like that. He only had me do the sun exercise for one year. You must come to class. This is all you're going to do. If you don't show up, don't come back and you're going to pay me. That's how those teachers work. And you're only going to do this. So you already knew what you're going to do. The same thing over and over again. Then after that year, okay, now we do variations and do this and do that. People today, how they mind are, at least the majority, they, people want all these things and there's so much information available because of the internet. Um, people's minds get tricked into thinking they can do all these kinds of things because they, they can understand it academically or they think they understand it. And to me, in most cases, it's dangerous. So that's why a lot of times I, you know, unless I'm, unless I have certain people committed to me one on one, and I put them through tests, that I will even broach the subject with them. 
Mm -hmm. uh, I hope that answered the question. Yeah, it does. Very interesting. You know, I'm looking here at uh, the notes that I've made in advance of our conversation, and there's too much good stuff here. I don't want to skim and give it short shrift. So we might have to do a sequel. I don't know how you feel about that. No, I'm okay with that. If Great. you want to ask me some more questions, I still have time to talk to you. If you if you have time. Sure. Okay. Well, let, why don't we talk about how you got into Chinese medicine, and then um, and then we can wrap it at that. And then uh, if you're willing to come back for sequel, I think that would be excellent. Then we can get more deeper into it. I don't want to skim some of these other topics that I've got here for you. That's fine. That's fine. Cool. I got into Chinese medicine. Well, there's several stories, but naturally studying Aikido and then later on Tai Chi and yoga, the, the, all my teachers, or the majority of them were either in the, either doing TCM or they were doing Ayurvedic medicine. So that's number one. So that's one part. The second part is, I already talked to you about my Native American background. So even though my mother and them went to the doctor at times and they, I had to go to the doctor to get shots. Uh, Dr. Bernstein was my doctor. And at that time, doctors came to your house. They had little black bags and they came to your house. And it wasn't like the way corporate medicine is today. And so they, they believed in food. You know, my mother, you know, like in our medicine, we talk about lifestyle and food. Well, my mother, you know, like every color of food was on my plate when I grew up, you know, and um, I ate good food. And I was always talked about the fact that food was very important for health. And so my mother wouldn't allow me to eat sweets. She didn't allow me to eat candy. Um, maybe since I've gotten older, I've, I've maybe in the last few years abused some things that I probably shouldn't have, but I didn't grow up that way. Um, I still don't eat candy, but I did get into like um, uh, sodas for a while. But um, I wasn't allowed to drink that, but maybe once a month or what have you as a, as a, um, as a treat. And I was taught to eat food and I ate food. And, you know, I, I learned how to cook by the time I was seven. I was in the kitchen. I had to spend a certain amount in the kitchen by the time I, when I was four. And so I learned about food from every aspect. So, um, so therefore I realized that on my father's side, they, my father and them, um, they were Native American, but my grandmother, they were Christian scientists. So Christian scientists believed, um, but that's where veganism comes from. Um, the founder of Christian science um, uh, 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 sect of Christianity, but they, they said everything was the mind. So now here comes the Buddhist influence again. My father and them would say, you're not really sick. This is all in your mind. And my mother would get mad. And he said, look, this is all in your mind. Ain't nothing, you know, so they were really into that mind, mind, mind thing. There again, there's a subtle influence that of what Buddhism would later talk about when I became more and more in, endowed in that. Going back to your question, though, we also coming into the 60s with the Black Panthers, the Civil Rights Movement, and I was very much a part of, of supporter of the Black Panthers. A lot of my friends, I wasn't a actual member of the Black Panthers, but a lot of my friends were members of the Black Panthers in the Republic of New Africa. And the Black Panthers were really the first group on a large scale that brought Oriental medicine to the community, not Richard Nixon. I know they say Richard Nixon went to China and and all that, but no, there were acupuncture clinics in the black community and they were using acupuncture as a means to, uh, um, for people with drug addiction, for, for, but for health period. So most of my friends were talking about Chinese medicine, you know, and acupuncture. So by the time I was 17, and then there's one other thing that happened. My mother was diagnosed with breast cancer when I was 12 and my mother had great insurance. She went to 12 different hospitals, but it was just me and my mother, including the Cancer Institute. And they said she had cancer and they would have to remove her breast. Now my mother's best friend had died of breast cancer. And at that time, a lot of women, um, that was the beginning of the breast cancer situation. My mother lived to be 102 and she never lost her breast because she went to a, some natural path and started taking herbs. So therefore, what that put in my mind is that how could all these doctors, how could all these hospitals make mistakes? And so my uncle being a mortician had went to medical school for three years, two or three years. And when he would embalm bodies, and at that time when I was a kid, I 
I would watch him in bomb bodies and he would look and say this pretty, he would look at the death certificate and say, these people didn't die of this, these people didn't die of that. So then what happened was I developed a, began to d develop a distrust towards what I would call cor the corporate medical system, uh, or, or some people call it Western medicine. I call it corporate medicine because Western medicine to me is Greek medicine, but that's another subject. So I transferred by the time I was able to make full decisions for myself at 17, 18 years old, I became a patient of, of TCM and Ayurvedic medicine. And two, I was able to go to school myself uh, and become uh, a, a doctor of TCM. You know, um, I was a patient of it. I raised my children on it. My mother became a patient of oriental medicine the last 35, 30, 35 years of her life. She totally uh, subscribed to Asian medicine and herbs. And so that's how, and then there's one other story. I, um, years ago, I was in a relationship with a woman and she was very sick. Um, she had Epstein-Barr or diagnosed with that. And um, there was an advertisement saying a Tibetan doctor was traveling through Michigan. I was like, a Tibetan doctor? I didn't even know Tibet had doctors. Like, Tibetan doctor and he's a llama. We're going to see this guy. It happened to be Charter Tupu Rinpoche. It was what, this 1987 or 88, somewhere around there. And so he's out. These people had like a farm or something like that. They had they had transformed this barn into like a, a, a temple or whatever. Anyway, so we go into the barn doing doing our doing our appointment. And he has a translator. He's sitting there, and man. He had these big molars from what I remember. I'm sitting there and he kept staring at me. And I'm like, say, why is this guy staring? I'm saying to myself, why is this dude staring at me? I, I didn't come to see him. I came to bring, <laughs> I came to bring my partner. And this is the, she, she's the one that had the problem. But he's sitting there moving his molars. And when he speaks in Tibetan, it's almost like his whole voice roared. I mean, from what I remember, it seemed like I thought the whole barn was getting ready to shake, you know? And so. But he didn't say anything for 30 minutes or so. And I was really getting nervous, man. This guy's looking at me and I was feeling nervous. And all of a sudden this voice comes in my head, say, you're going to be a Tibetan doctor and you're also going to be a Chinese doctor. And I'm like, why am I thinking this stuff? Why am I thinking this stuff? So when I was getting, the day I was graduating from Dragon Rises, I thought about that. I said, Charter Tupu Rinpoche said I was going to be a Chinese doctor. He put that thought in my, either he put that thought or he knew karmically that that was what I was supposed to do, one or the other, you understand? So those would be the actual incidents, I would say, that led up to the distrust towards corporate medicine, my teachers, uh, my martial art and yoga teachers and energetic teachers being doctors themselves, and that experience with Charles Tuku Rinpoche. Um, those three things, I would say, uh, had to do with me actually uh, moving in that direction. Mm -hmm. And being a yoga teacher for years and people come to me asking me about their, their physical problems. And I'm like, well, I'm not no doctor. Why you keep asking me? And I know one lady came and I could see that she had a tumor in her stomach. She said, I'm sick. I said, yeah, you have this big tumor in your stomach. I don't know. I just said that. She came back three or four weeks later and said, how did you know I had a tumor in my stomach? You understand? And so... I had those kind of incidents happening too, you know? So I was like, well, shoot, maybe one day this is what I, maybe I need to be doing this, you know what I'm saying? So that was just something, but I didn't take it serious because I didn't think the opportunity would come up, but the opportunity did come up. And once I got in, it was transformative. Going to Dragon Rises was very transformative. It's going to transform my life in a certain way, very dynamic way. And then going to the Atlantic uh, Institute of Oriental Medicine was just a fantastic experience. And then being able to come to the Soar Ribby Institute, because see, really, I wanted to be a Tibetan doctor. I didn't even want to do TCM, but I couldn't find no place to do Tibetan medicine. So I did the, the next best thing. But when I went to the Atlantic Institute, my thesis, my doctoral thesis was on the, uh, on um, treating the mind, use a, a comparison between Tibetan and, and um TCM. So they knew then I was, I was then heavy into um, Tibetan way. I knew that's what I wanted to do. And then when the opportunity with Christiana and all of them gave me the opportunity to come to um, 
the Soar Reap, you know, brought that, uh, when I became aware of the Soar Reap Institute and became involved with that, that was like a dream come true. Especially then with Dr. Nita, because naturally with the experiences I've had, I know for a fact that the things he's talking, that he's talking about, that he's telling the truth. Because there's some people that don't say everything. I'll just put it that way. You know, but he he's like, it, from my experiences and everything I've seen, I can re, I can relate to everything he's talking about, and I know that the information that's being that we get in Soar River Institute is correct. So I hope that answers the question. It does, yeah, fascinating. Well, all of that stuff, you know, that's a whole podcast in itself. So let's dive into that in the sequel. Your experiences in all these different healing modalities, and you have worked in all kinds of situations. You've you mentioned educational institutions, but you've also worked in hospitals, mental health facilities government and law enforcement, you've worked in all these interesting situations and brought this perspective and this melting pot of uh, studies that you've undertaken into those situations. I'd love to talk to you about that in more detail, as well as your three books, Ghetto Sutras, Treatment of Shen, which sounds like that was worked up from your thesis. Um, uh, That's right. Yeah. yeah. And Maha Yoga also, your, your system of yoga, Maharu Yoga. So, I mean, there's, there's so much to talk about. Um, sequel, let's do it. Okay. Great. Thank you very much, Mr. Brother James. I appreciate it. And um, just let me know when you want to do the next one. And I'll, I'll set, the time, set aside the time based on your schedule and we can do part two. Excellent. Dr. K.A. Shakur, thank you very much. You're very welcome. Peace and blessings to you. Thank you for listening to another Guru Viking podcast. For more interviews like these, as well as articles, videos, and guided meditations, visit www.guruviking.com.